Um, today, Eric Gilland is going to be talking to us about a visitor project that he worked on with the DTC. Um, a little background with Eric, he's, he got his PhD at Colorado State University in statistics, <laughs> and he's been at NCAR in some capacity for at least 20 years. Started off as a student, and I think you were an associate scientist for a little while, and um, now as a project scientist too, right? Okay, so um, anyway, I, uh, I'm i excited to hear about Eric's projects. So through uh, his visitor project, we've been expanding uh, some of the capabilities um, with respect to MET. So this will be coming out with, uh, I think, the next release of MET. So that would be great. So anyway, I will turn it over to him. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. So can everybody hear me with the microphone? OK. So this work ended up being kind of joint work with a bunch of people. Uh, some of the names you might recognize, like um, Barb Brown. Yeah, she is. OK, good. <laughs> um, and some of you might even recognize some of the others um, from way back. But um, all people that have been very involved in spatial verification, uh, mostly from the beginning. Gregor Skok is kind of, well, he's younger, you know. So, so he hasn't been at it as long, but um, has done some really good work. And um, so. I know also a lot of you are very familiar with spatial verification, but I know not everyone is. So um, just give a sort of a, a quick background on the issues and, and some of the, the things that have been going on. Um, basically, as you got higher resolution forecasts, um, you would compare your verification results against the coarser resolution model. And then the coarser resolution model always ended up being the better model, right? <laughs> and but people looking at it would say, well, you know, like on the far left there's the high resolution, on the far right is you know observing stations, and in the middle is this coarse resolution model. Well, which do you think? Just looking at that is better, right? And and the answer, of course, depends on what you want from your forecast model. But in a lot of cases, you'd want it to say something about how the higher resolution model captures more of the detail and, and such. Um, so there are different reasons for that. And um, one is just that if you have a forecast that predicts the observation perfectly in every detail except the location, so you, you don't overlap at all, you're going to get really bad verification scores. But you're going to get penalized twice for it. So you're going to get penalized for the false alarm over on the left, and then penalized for the miss over on the right. Um, and maybe, maybe that's too much penalty. Maybe it is. Maybe it's good. <laughs> you know that depends again. Um, and then another issue is just what you can see more with that first figure. Um, you're you're obviously going to have a lot more little errors that get accumulated with the high resolution model than you will with the coarse resolution model. Um, and so just those small scale errors can kind of over accumulate. Um, so <laughs> at some point, Barb made these nice um, geometric shapes to kind of illustrate all of these different things that can happen. And so um, at some point, we turned her illustration into actual data. <laughs> Right, and so we had, we had these forecasts, which are all the pink circles and and ovals, and then the the green is the same observation in each field. So these are like competing forecasts, and the va the intensity values are the same, even though we're using different colors. Um, and so one thing you can see is that the so the first forecast is in the upper right panel, and then so that's the B, and then C is the second. And if you go down to D, it turns out that all of the traditional verification <coughs> measures um, give the same value for that for those forecasts because it's all the same size and shape and everything, and and they don't overlap at all, right? So it's just all the same miss areas and and false alarm. Um, whereas that last one, the huge where you just forecast over the whole country. Um, gets a little bit better on a lot of the scores simply because it overlaps, right? 
And, and again, maybe that's good, right? Because maybe, maybe that's all you care about is did it get my, you know, where I'm interested in. Um, but one thing that's important about that is there's no diagnostic information to tell you that, well, maybe B is better than C and, and D, you know? So, um, so there's also just aside from getting information that's more consistent with what you would observe, there's also the idea of, well, how did the forecast go wrong? And is there a way to summarize information about that? And so that prompted just a slew of people to, well, maybe not a slew of people, but a, a group of people <laughs> in, in various places to come up with a slew of new uh, methods to, to, val to verify these kind of forecasts. And I think largely because in other fields they already had techniques, you know, so they already had image analysis, you know, these Facebook and things where they're recognizing your face. Well, that technology had already started, you know, in the 50s, I think, 1950s, um, not the 1850s, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, although maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> So, so uh, yeah, so so yeah, image analysis, computer vision, um, and then just spatial statistics, right? I mean, um, people have been interested in comparing spatial fields in a kind of a different way in, in spatial statistics, and so that's why I think a lot of those methods haven't really made it in here as much. But um, so because there were so many methods. Um, we decided a long time ago to do a, a big inner comparison sort of project. And we used real um, verification sets that came from the, um, uh, what is it, NSSL, no, NCEP, NCAR, or NCEP, NSSL, I forget now, spring, whoever does the spring experiments, <laughs> NSSL, yes, the National Severe Storms Laboratory. And um, so they do these. Uh, Experiments in the summertime, and, and so we used the 2005 experiments for real data and just kind of selected cases out of that. Um, then we took one of those cases and we perturbed things around, so we just like moved, which turned out to not be as useful as we had hoped. Um, but then we used those geometric cases I just showed, uh, which turned out to be the most useful by far. In terms of gleaning, you know, what are these various methods telling you? Or, you know, are some of them just telling us the same thing and maybe one of them is easier to do? Um, and what we found is that basically they all f fit into these f two categories, so filtering or displacement. And then each of those categories could kind of be split into two categories. So a filter is like you can just smooth the the high resolution forecast to a coarser scale and then just do your traditional, you know, and there are more interesting methods than just that, but that's kind of, you know, the broad idea of filtering. Um, or you could do like a wavelet decomposition and, and do comparisons that way where you actually separate out the scales more and, and then do comparisons there. And, and there's actually a, a whole breadth of different methods under those headings and they're not all quite as, you know, black and white as that, but, um, and then others focus more on this issue of getting the right location. And um, so in that, you know, some of them tried to take the whole field and like morph it in some way so that it better aligned with, your, with the observations. Um, and then did your traditional verification usually, or, or sometimes they had their own summary. Um, and then others went just completely nuts and just tried to identify features within the field. And, you know, and so, of course, and, that, and it's a very useful method. You know. um, but, so we call that more the feature base. So you actually go in and say, okay, well, here are some objects in this part. You know, let's match them up and make comparisons um, and then and do it that way. And so, of course, mode is a good example of that um, and that being already in the MET software. Um, Eric, at yeah. what scale do some of these, you know, spatial forecasting? At what scale does that start to become a problem? A, a problem important, actually. I was uh, going to say, sure, yeah, 
like how high does the resolution yeah, have to be? You know, does it more, you know, you, you start to have more problems with uh, yeah. not being able to do the course statistics. That's a, it's a good question. I haven't yeah. ever asked it, but I know when we were doing this in 2005, it was already an issue. Yeah, okay. And I okay. believe, what were they, four kilometer, I think, resolution. So, yeah. But, but also, you know, if you look at, like, these coarse scale climate models, but you look at the entire globe, right? Now suddenly you have this problem again. So it's sort of relative to the size of your domain, oh, I sure, think, too. Sure, you know? sure. um, yeah. But yeah, it's a good question. I really haven't thought about that, Mike. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so I don't, I guess because of the recording, <laughs> um, maybe the people watching the recording didn't hear the question, but it was just at what resolution does um, this double penalty and over accumulation of small scale errors, what resolution, does that become a problem? And my answer was, I don't know. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay, so then um, a little later we kind of realized that there's also this category of just distance metrics. And they get used in the feature base to some extent, like I know Mode uses centroid distance um, and, and some others, I think. And um, and then there's these just really crazy methods that really try to morph things around. So one, for example, I worked a lot on image warping, and it's a really cool method. It's very difficult to implement. Um, it turns out, and it, once you get it going in one software language, you know it, it's not going to work in the next one. You know you have to rethink everything. You know, and so then thinking about trying to validate between you know different software codes, it, it can be problematic. Um, it's not to say it's a bad method, it's just to say it's a lot more complicated and I think more difficult to actually include in something like MET where it's more operational and, you know, so I think it's maybe easier in the, or better in the research domain, I, I suppose. Um, although there is, you know, this pyramid um, scheme <laughs> by, that is maybe a little easier to automate. Um, but anyway, so really the focus that I'm talking about today is going to be on these distance measures. And, um, but a lot of the test cases that we're proposing don't just have the distance measures in mind necessarily, but that's kind of the main thing. But um, I'm going to show results for just some of these <laughs> distance measures um, and predominantly the ones that we're adding to MET. So... Um, so the first thing to think about, though, is what is important, you know, and what do we need to know about these measures? Um, because, you know, is this a good forecast, right? How many say yes? Depends. Um, <laughs> come on, Mike. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> no, Mike's right. It, the answer is that it depends. <laughs> well, okay, so. I, I would say absolutely it's... it's, it's you know, not a good forecast if you're interested about what's happening over me. Right. If you're trying to understand features and your ability to represent convection and so on, better uh, than we worry about, you know, displacement and so on. I've got darn good convection, but you guys aren't giving me the right winds to translate it to the right place. Yeah. So that's my depends. Yeah. And no, it does depend. What's the X, right? Because they are, you're talking about hundreds yeah, of yeah, kilometers. Yeah, right, mm -hmm. right, right. If that were one kilometer. Right, yeah, so also, yeah, Very good point. what is the scale, you know? <laughs> but um, certainly, if you're a watershed manager here, <laughs> that's a really bad forecast because you just completely yeah. missed it. Yeah, but if true. you're, you know, worried about moving your, you know, planning your flight path or something, then maybe it's a good. And, I, and by the way, I'd, I stole this from Barb <laughs> a long time. I'd, I'd, oh, I did say, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So in math, they have an idea about measures and, or, and what, and so they have a specific thing that they call a metric. And that's why I've been careful not to say metrics so far, even if on, I know on Barb's, Barbara Cassati's um, figure on the last slide, it said metric, but, um, but that's okay. Uh, so the mathematical idea of a metric can is not necessarily what we want, <laughs> okay? But it is good, so there are some good features, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that as we go. But 
So basically, a measure that is positive or zero, okay, sometimes they include that as one of the properties or sometimes we say it at the beginning. So it's greater than or equal to zero and it's a metric then if it's equal to zero if and only if those two event sets are identical, okay? Um, or if I should say the A and the B are identical. Um, it has to be symmetric. So if you, if you do AB versus BA, um, you know, you put the one in first and the other second and, and you switch them around, you should get the same answer. Okay, sounds good, right? Symmetry, we like symmetry. Um, and then there's this triangle inequality that you see at the bottom. And this one is maybe a little bit more mysterious, but it does actually make some kind of sense. And it just says that if C is closer to A than B, then the measure uh, between A and C is less than the measure between A and B. Okay, so it just ensures that. Um, so it's actually a really good property. It's one of the more difficult to show if you have a measure and you want to prove that it's a metric. But, um, but that's what that is. So, uh-oh. I think I did. Oh. No. I, I see my logic now. Okay. <laughs> I think I changed this as I was practicing. So, Okay, so anyway, uh, so I mentioned the centroid distance. Now, a centroid is just your center of mass, right, of either your entire field or maybe you do it just on a single feature. Um, and so basically, a centroid is a single point, is the thing to remember, right? And it's a metric. Sorry, the centroid distance is a metric because it's just the distance between two points, right? And those two points are the centers of mass of these event sets. And, and it is a true mathematical metric, so it satisfies those three properties. So on the left, B is just this ring. A is this blue circle. That's a perfect score for the centroid distance. <laughs> on the right, the centroid distance is going to be positive, so it's going to give a worse value than on the left. So it might not be telling you what you really want to know, or it might be, depending on how important it is to get that center of mass and how much value you place in that. So it could also just be one measure, right? Because not one single summary is not going to tell you everything you need to know. But it's important to understand <laughs> that things can be very different, and you get a perfect score, and they can be almost identical, and you don't get a perfect score. That's kind of the point there. So another distance that was um, very popular back um, some time ago in the early days is this Hausdorff distance. And what that is, if you can see, let's see if, yeah. So you can see this cursor here. So I'm gonna move up here. The furthest point away from A that's in B is the tip of that triangle there. And then if you follow that yellow line, if you can even see the yellow line, but it goes down to the nearest point in the set A of the other thing. That's the Hausdorff distance. It's the maximum distance from B to the nearest point in A from that. Okay? <laughs> so that's just what it is. And it, sort of like the centroid distance, there are sort of obvious ways that this might not tell you what you really want to know. So for example, if we now include B where it's this thing that looks just like A and overlaps with A, but you have a small point, and maybe, maybe that point is a single point. Right? I, I made a circle so you could see it. Um, but it's that same yellow line <laughs> here, right? So it doesn't necessarily tell you what you want to know. Um, but maybe, but it doesn't mean it doesn't provide useful information at the same time. Um, so a bunch of these other measures, and we'll see that including the Hausdorff, uh, can be based on these distance maps. And that's important because a distance map can be um, can be computed very quickly, right? There are fast computer algorithms to do it. Where without that, it would be really difficult to 
because you'd have to calculate all those distances within an object or and and so it turns out it's it's quicker to do it over the entire field <laughs> so so I have just an event set A and an event set B, okay? So maybe I had these forecasts and I set a threshold and I'm left with these two circles, <laughs> right? So it's just zeros and ones. And I'm only interested in the distance between these sets. And um, so the distance map for A, I take at every single grid point, I, f I find the distance between that grid point and the nearest point in that set. And so... On the, on the right are the two distance maps for those two sets, and that's just kind of what they look like, right? So there's zero where the event is happening, and then they sort of radiate out, you know, increasing values. Um, and so one thing in particular to keep in mind is that your domain size and shape is going to affect what these distance maps look like, okay? So we need to be careful that these measures aren't, are not affected by that, or if they are, that we... Un that we know that they are, and, and understand how much they could be affected. Um, and so again, just to kind of reiterate, this is just a depiction. So from each grid point, I'm calculating a shortest distance to the nearest point in that set, um, just to really reiterate that. So it turns out that one useful thing to do is to take the absolute ma the magnitude of the difference between the two distance maps. right? So that's what that would look like on the right. And it turns out that the Hausdorff distance is just the maximum of this field. Um, so that's nice because now you have this fast way of calculating these distances and now you can get this Hausdorff metric, which is a true metric also, just to emphasize. Um, but people didn't like the sensitivity to... Like if I add a point somewhere, then now that changes the value of the Hausdorff metric drastically, right? So if in A, I, I added just a single point up in the corner, it's going to change what that distance map looks like considerably. And, and when you're taking the max, it's going to be highly sensitive to that. And so um, one alternative to that that was proposed by Adrian Baddeley uh, is this delta metric that's just the LP norm of this field. And the, the cool thing about that is the LP norm sort of includes Hausdorff as a special case. So if you let the P go to infinity, then you end up getting the maximum value back. So it's like a, the Hausdorff is a special case. Um, if P equals 1, then you get just the straight average of that field. Um, but usually people use P equal to 2. And I, I don't know if that has any um, real reason, but, <laughs> but it's sort of what, <laughs> it's what most, what we usually use. It's sort of like a Euclidean distance in that case. Um, yeah. And what else did I want to say? Oh, so the other thing with the Baddeley metric, though, is um, because he's aware of, he was aware of um, this issue with the do domain, and he said, well, let's, you know, do something about that. And so it turns out if you apply a convex function, and usually you just use this cutoff function. So you just say, if the distance is greater than some amount, just set it to that amount, right? Just make it a constant after that so that you sort of curb um, the sensitivity to the domain. And, and it does work a little bit. Uh, <laughs> so... But in everything I'm going to show, uh, I think I'm using just infinity for that constant, <laughs> okay? which is to say the maximum size. So I'm, in other words, I'm not applying the cutoff. Okay, and so just to be um, sort of complete, that's mathematically what the battle metric looks like. And I'm, I apologize for putting it so low on the screen. <laughs> I, I forgot what room I was working in here, and I, I was trying to put too much on. But um, you can see that's just the LP norm, so it's just the average of this, of this field raised to the pth power. So this field, raise it to the pth power, then do your average, and then take the pth root of that answer. So, so you just add up over the whole field. Okay. Um, 
Now one I like is this mean error distance, which is not a metric. Okay, and I think it's, I think there's a good reason for um, using it um, because it, it violates the symmetry property of a metric. But if you think about it from a, and, and we'll see this as we go, but if you think about it from for, a forecast verification standpoint, you're getting, you're looking at false alarms versus misses in that way. Okay, so, so and we'll see that. So basically what you do for the, for this metric is you take A, the binary field A, and you overlay it onto the distance map for B. <coughs> okay, and you ignore everything but what's inside that set A. And then it's just the average of those distances. Okay. That's if it's MEDAB, right? And if it's MEDBA, then we take B and overlay it onto the distance map for A and take that average. So that's why it's not symmetric. Right? Um, and just to be clear again, <laughs> so if I'm taking the distance, it's the MED from B to A in this pictorial here, um, you can see I'm taking every point in B and just finding the nearest, the distance to the nearest point in A. So in this case, they're all going to be on this yellow line of A, right? So that's what you're averaging over. Yeah. Um, so another measure that's very similar to this one, um, but this time, so so I should say, for the Hausdorff and for the Baddeley, you know, the a perfect score is zero, right? If you're if you get it exactly right, it's going to be zero, and then the higher the value. <coughs> the worse it is. And the way I'm doing it here, I'm just counting grid squares, you know, and that's sort of, in order to take advantage of these fast algorithms, that's what you use. Um, so it, it's an average value in terms of grid square distance, okay, shortest distance of grid squares. So it has a unit that we can make some sense of. Um, this Pratt's figure of merit is a unitless quantity, and um, so that's the reason for dividing by the maximum between the number of points in A and the number of points in B. And then it's just sort of 1 over 1 plus this alpha times this sort of MED idea, right? This distance from one set to the other squared. Um, so again, it's not symmetric, right? Um, so therefore not a metric. And, and then, and sorry, this one's really down at the bottom, but it's the easiest one now to explain. <laughs> so first you take that A and B on the left, the binary fields, and you just do a root mean squared error of that. And then you just do a weighted average between that and the mean error distance. Okay. And that's, it, it's good because then you get um, an, a sense of the frequency bias as well as the um, distance issue all in one place. Okay. Yeah, so what kind of prompted this work is that these geometric cases we had were very useful, but they didn't, but there are more cases that could be applied, more situations that we might be interested in. And we came up with a lot of cases. I'm not going to go through every single one. <laughs> okay, so rest assured. And, um, and all of the cases that I made up now, so these were on like a, I think it was 601 by 501, four kilometer, whatever that, that grid was from the spring experiment. Um, but, but all the subsequent cases I'm showing are just a 200 by 200 grid, and, and they're all completely made up, right, by me, well, by me and the co-authors. Um, and so the first set of cases is actually um, one of the most common things that you run into uh, operationally, right? And that's that, like, maybe it's a rain forecast and it doesn't rain anywhere, right? So you have nothing in the field. And that turns out that causes all kinds of problems for, like, pretty much every method. And it's something that nobody considered, like, when we were first doing it. I, I think nobody, I, you know. I, I, I know I'd... I think we all kind of said, eh, let's not worry about that. But... Um, but <laughs> 
but it's a it's problematic, and um, we'll see in a minute that it, it, it really is problematic. Um, the other is like, okay, maybe it's a cloud forecast, and and maybe you're, it's a very cloudy area, and so maybe you've set for a cloud amount a threshold of say fifty percent or sixty percent or something. So now the entire field is covered with cloud, right? And so then what happens if it's completely covered with cloud? And it turns out that that's maybe less of a problem <laughs> than if the entire thing. But, but let's see, right? And so, for example, if you do P1 minus P1 or P2 minus P2, you get the same thing. It's zero everywhere, right? So that could be problematic. Um, and otherwise, you get these other situations. And it turns out that you can, so I say undefined, you can define it because it, and it is defined technically um, so those distance maps if there's no event they're defined to be infinity at the points which is, would be undefined but then usually in practice they say well set it to the size of the domain right and you can do that and then I'll show you in a second why you don't want to do that <laughs> but uh, <laughs> on the other hand for the full case you take the one minus the other well, there are, it gives a perfect score for all of them. And so I, I should have said also the figure of merit is a little different. So the worst is zero, and then the best is one. And it's between zero and one. And so that's the nice thing about that is it gives you a, like a value that you can readily say, oh, 0.5, you know, I'm in the middle or something. Um, yeah. So what do I say here now? Yeah, so I already said that <laughs> part. So here's the problem with coming up with a way of handling those null cases, right? Is what if I turn a single point on now somewhere in the field? And, you know, because a lot of people say, oh, well, in that case, just, okay, put in a little fudge term in the denominator because, you know, you don't want to divide by zero or, you know, do this or that. And, and that can fix it for the perfect case, you know, and it should be perfect, right, if it's, a, a null field and a null field, then it's a perfect forecast. But if you add a point, then it's then it can blow up <laughs> right away. But it's still a good forecast because it's just one point that you got wrong in the, in the whole grid. Um, and so, it, to kind of keep in mind, these measures are great, but you need stuff in the field. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you should keep track of your frequency bias and the numbers of points. And so that's another thing that's going to be output in the MET is just how many points are in each field. And, and you should always, with all your summaries, you should always keep track of that and know what's going on um, for those. And so just for example, if you do the centroid, just, uh, or the centroid, um, for those two on the bottom, it's the same, right? But it's going to be different for those two in the top, right? It's going to be very different, in fact. So the centroid distances can be heavily influenced by where did that point turn on, and maybe it's just some kind of scatter, right? Some kind of random random noise or something. So it's important to keep that in mind. Um, so I'm not sure what, <laughs> what I was... Now I don't remember what I was going to say on this slide, but... I think I meant to already be on this slide when I said the last thing. <laughs> okay. So it, it turns out those pathological cases are very important to consider, and so I think it's important to have them in this um, deal. And, but, but, but they're not very interesting as far as <laughs> actual cases, but they're very important to consider. Um, so the next set are really, I think, the most useful for me and... Um, I made them circles, uh, which it also turns out is nice because you know properties of circles, right? They have radi radii and circumferences and things like that. So um, it makes it sort of easy. And so this first case is really a series of cases, and it's just to show, um, and this actually came out of a paper I did before this, um, but the two cases are identical circles. They're identically transformed, or, yeah, not transformed, but translated <laughs> um, 
the same amount, right? So C1 and C2 are identical to C2 and C3, and C and C2 and C4, except C2 and C2, 4, they're vertical, right? To our, they're in maybe a different position within the domain. And so you can see, so you, ideally you'd want the same value, right, <laughs> for all of these. But you can see that Baddeley's delta changes. It doesn't change a lot. It's not super sensitive to this. But it changes, and that's sort of suboptimal, and that's because of the distance map, right? And, it, and it's sensitive to the whole thing. And it still changes even if you use this cutoff function, by the way. It's more exaggerated by not using it. But um, so, like I say, it's not bad. It's not terrible because they they're not that different. But, you know, ideally it doesn't do that. And so you can see that, for example, the mean error distance is the same for all three. Actually, all the others are the same for all, all the rest of them. Um, and you'll notice here that there is a symmetry with the figure of merit and the mean error distance. And that's only because it's a special case where everything, the two things you're comparing are the same size and shape, right? And so it's in general not going to be true, <laughs> but just in case anyone noticed that. Um, and I should say also, so I made these circles to have a radius of 20. And um, so the radii are 40 apart. So that's why the centroid distance is 40. Um, you notice the Hausdorff distance is about the same as the centroid distance here, so it's actually giving you that translation error pretty close. Um, and you also notice the figure of merit is close to zero, so it doesn't really like any of these cases, right? And that's maybe good because they don't overlap at all, so that's one reason. Um, and then the mean error distance is almost the radius, right? Because on average, that's how far apart they are. <laughs> so, yeah. So now this case, you have a circle and then another circle centered on the same point, but it's much bigger. Okay, so, so it's not a ring this time. It's actually two cases, and I've taken one minus the other. And... Um, so the so I, as you can see, maybe the the smaller circle is again 20, has a radius of twenty, the larger has a radius of sixty. So the distance oh, the distance between say here and here is forty, right? And so you can see the delta that Baddeley's delta is almost forty. Hausdorff is close to forty. Centroid distance here is zero right, because they have the same centroid, perfect score. Um, and then the Jus metric is neat here because, uh, again, it's counting the overlap, right? It's a weighted average of the o overlap and, um, and the mean error distance. So, so it's accounting for both, and that's why it's a much larger value than, than the mean error distance, for example. Um, and then, uh, and then this is where I think the mean error distance is nice that it's not symmetric because when you do it one way, so from the larger circle to the small circle, on average, it's about 20. And that's because if, you know, it's 40 from the outer edge, right? So on average, it would be 20 in the middle. So, it's, so that's what the, that tells you. But then if you go the other way, that from the smaller circle to the bigger circle, it's completely contained, so it's a perfect score, right? So it's, so it's zero. So it tells you if, um, if that were, if the smaller circle, circle were the observation, then you have a lot of false alarm, right? But you didn't miss anything. So, and whereas if you're coming the other way, you have a lot of false alarm. Sorry, I said that wrong. So the first one, you didn't miss anything, so it's a perfect score. The other way, you have a lot of false alarms, so you get a higher value. Um, and that's why I think that, you know, it's not necessarily a bad me me measure, <laughs> given that it's not a metric. So in, like, fields like image analysis, they discarded it pretty quickly because it wasn't a metric, right? Um, so it just depends on what you need. Um, so this one is two circles that have been translated in equal but opposite directions, but otherwise it's identical, right? 
because you don't always get a straight transformation, right? If you did, it would be very easy to verify <laughs> these things. So I wanted a case that, that did that. Um, I won't go through it in the same amount of detail, but again, the centroid distance is perfect, right? Because it's equal but opposite this time. <laughs> so it's another way that you can... A lot of these I came up with just to give the centroid distance a hard time. Uh, <laughs> but, but only because it's easy to think about the centroid distance. Um, so yeah. Are you considering both blue circles part of one? Oh, so so what it is is they're actual circles, and then I took one field minus the other. So the red is when C12 is there, mm -hmm. but not C6. And then the blue is when C6 is there, but not C12. And then the white is where it's zero, so they were either zero or they intersected. So that's... So you have to kind of imagine, and I should have shown the actual cases, but but imagine two fields with, you know, the first one has circles that are vertical to each other, and the second one has those same two circles, but they're offset in equal but opposite directions. And and then I took the one minus the other. If that, <laughs> if that makes sense. I should have shown the actual... So. But you still have... In, in, say, like your observation field, you have two circles, and in your forecast, you have two circles, but they're not, they're offset in some way. Yeah. But you're considering them all, I guess you're not defining the object. Right, yeah, so so good point is that I'm considering the entire field here. Okay. So you could look at these, at objects individually. Right, also. okay, that's where I was getting But, this. yeah, so I'm not doing a mode thing. Okay. You can apply these to mode. You know, where you would just take maybe the top two and they would merge together and that would be, and then, but then you'd have a simpler situation. Right. Sorry. So, so here I'm just doing it to the entire field. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I should have emphasized that. All right. Um, and yeah, and again, they're the same size and shape, so the, we have symmetry now with those. With the I think down. with the centroid distance, mm -hmm. you can explain that. It's really yeah. the, the centroid between. The two red dots is one point, right? And the equivalent then on the blue is the centroid between the two blue dots, and they overlap, and therefore yeah. it's... They just have the same centroid, right? right? So if you calculate the centroid for the two that are offset, it's the same as the two oh, that are not okay. offset. Okay. And that's why it's perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's where the equal but opposite translations are. That's what makes it have the same centroid. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the one thing I, I want to point out, so this Pratt's figure of merit now is 0.3, so much better than the 0 0.07, and that's because now you see they actually overlap a little bit, so it's um, so that gives you some sense there. And this case actually I think is one of the more interesting. It's The centroid is now not zero anymore because I didn't have a circle below it. <laughs> Right, so again, we have three circles and then one circle, and I'm taking the difference between the fields. So basically, the blue is C2, and then C11 is the red, and this, this one, there's no overlap okay. this time. Um, so um, Baddeley's delta is this is close to what it was for the others, um, because on average, it's sort of the same error. Right, Hausdorff again is still 40, and they're they're all translated. 40, right, away from each other. So if, if it were just one, the centroid distance would be 40, right? But now the centroid distance is being pulled because the center mass of the three red is being pulled. How come it's 40.2 and not exactly? Oh, <laughs> because so I'm, I'm calculating it from these distance maps. And so one of the, one reason is that, you know, if you go vertical, um, it's like the value is one. If you go to the diagonal, it's not one anymore. Okay. And, and it's even worse than that, actually. Like it's, you know, that's if you did it the way I would do it in my head. You know, it'd be square root of two going the other way. It's, it's a little different even than that, though, how, they, how the distance is calculated. So it's, that's the reason why, yeah, it's not going to be like perfectly what the value is. Yeah. And I mean, there can also be rounding errors and things, but. Um, because it was actually 40 point and then a bunch of, <laughs> you know, so that's, everything's been rounded. And you'll notice uh, some of the values, I, I didn't have the full value because I was taking it from something we did where we rounded it to the whole number. 
And so that's the reason for the question marks, because <laughs> I, <laughs> it's just to show that you know I, there was there would be, <laughs> you know, some other number there, but I don't know at this point what it what that number was, and I didn't have time to go and redo it. But, um, uh, so yeah, there were some things I wanted to say here. So yeah, so oh, so with the mean error distance, so going from C11, so from the three and calculating the shortest distance down, it's the same as it was before when it was just two of them, because it's just the average. And so then it's the average of the three, and they're all the same number. <laughs> so it's the same value. And, but if you go the other way now, from the blue to the reds, now it's closer to you know these, the points that are over here. Instead of being far away from there, now they, they're very, very close to here. And so that's the reason why it's smaller. So again, looking at it both ways kind of tells you a little bit of, about misses and false alarms. It also points to the fact that it's not necessarily sensitive to bias <laughs> the way you want it to be, maybe. <laughs> right? So it's another reason to carry that bias you know, in the number of points along with you. And then, of course, the Jus metric, uh, it's not a metric. <laughs> so I, let me say something about that. So um, this paper by Zhu et al. And is the reason I call it Zhu's measure. They were actually interested in comparative forecast verification. So they had two forecasts. And they went through great trouble to make a metric for comparing those two forecasts. And then it seems they didn't go to as much trouble if you didn't have comparative. Because they said, well, if you don't have a comparative situation, then it's just... Um, then just do this, right? What I showed you, and but it's no longer a metric <laughs> because it's just the mean error distance and the RMSE part's a metric, but the but the mean error distance part is not. So anyway, you could make it a metric pretty easily, but but anyway, um, you can see now it actually goes up in value because now you have more um, of these circles to worry about, uh, or more, I guess depending on whether C11 is your observation or your forecast, either more miss or more false alarm. Okay. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> I should have just done this from the beginning and just made illustrations. <laughs> so it's not the actual thing. <laughs> it looks a lot nicer. But um, I, I just didn't have time to go and you know, write the code and, and make it go. So I, so I made this illustration just using shapes and PowerPoint. Um, but this one I actually had intended for mode, right? Because I was thinking about the case, well, how do you match the blue with the, with the two red here, <laughs> right? Because they're both the same size, same way apart. And I think it's an interesting thing if you come up with a way to merge and match in mode to consider, you know, does it favor the vertical? Does it favor the one below it? You know, because it's going to have to choose one, right? Unless you depending on how you're doing it. Um, but as you come up with a new method, that was kind of my, my logic here. But just to note that now the centroid distance is zero because they all have the same center of mass. And um, the Hausdorff distance, though, is still this 40.20. <laughs> so it's getting the like sort of total translation regardless of whether they're equal and opposite. And So it's kind of a neat measure, actually. Um, and then the Jus metric again. So... Um, now, if you didn't like this lack of symmetry, um, so for example, I think Baddeley's metric, metric is a good metric, but if you were worried about this sensitivity to the, do the edge and the domain and everything, um, if you just took the average of the two directions of the mean error distance, um, it, it's going to give you similar information. And um, we'll see that in the next slide. But um, you could also take the minimum, which means you sort of don't care if there's something awry as long as something is good, right? Or it, you don't want anything to be bad, so you could take the maximum. And in any case, and you could do that with the figure of merit or the, the others, the Jew as well. Um, in fact, if you used average MED instead of MED in the Jew, you'd have a metric. Um, but... We, we did some comparing of 
and, and I list out all these cases. I didn't show all of them, and I'm sure you don't remember all of them, but you don't need to for, what, <laughs> for the point here. Um, but the first column is the battle east delta. The second is the mean error distance in one direction and then in the other direction, and then the average of those two directions. And then DFSS is something I didn't talk about and I can't tell you much about because I haven't read that paper yet. <laughs> Sorry, Gregor, in case you're watching this. Um, <laughs> but it's something that Gregor and um, Nigel Roberts, they did a paper on. And um, it's basically a way to get a distance measure out of the fraction skill score approach. Um, and you'll notice there are some missing values there, and that's because at least at the moment, the way it is, it, it's undefined if you have a lot of bias, apparently, in the field. So, um, so I'm not going to talk about that, but the, the, I had this graphic, so I kept it there. Um, so like, if you look at the average MED column and the, and the Baddeley column, you can see that they kind of rank very similarly. Like There might be some differences, but, but you could use this average MED as an alternative to the battle if you wanted. Um, but basically all of these kind of give, you know, and I'm, I'm not showing the figure of merit here because we, we didn't talk about it too much in our, when we did this, but, um, but they all give similar values. But there are, and, I, and we went through, there are important differences between them. And that was why I, it was suggested to me at some point, and I, I might still do this, but um, just plotting the values, you know, and saying, well, if they're in a line, then they give you the same information. But... I think it's good to plot them, but to understand that, well, maybe there's some important characteristics that you need to keep in mind. You know, like maybe even a special case that can pop up. And, you know, one, for example, with the mean error distance is I found a case where there was a small amount of activity in, in an area where, um, and I don't remember if it was the forecast or the observation now, but <laughs> but that small area, you know, is for precipitation. It could have been a major storm, right? Because those end up being kind of small and we tend to skip over those when we look at these fields. And um, so it actually pulled that case out because one direction of MED was just much higher than everything else. And so it, it might actually be important to look at the, the two different directions. Um, so I'm not going to talk much about these, but we had a bunch of other cases. These were intended for this um, complex terrain project we had going on. So we were trying to mimic <laughs> stuff with complex terrain, but we basically took different um, ellipses where we either translated them, rotated them, or had a different size, and then did little different combinations of those. And um, it's a lot more to sift through. And, and then there were, there were a few other things. Um, Eric, that, is it hard to generalize yeah. some of this stuff so you actually deform the ellipse into something that's, you know, not so pretty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, and then, and then right. you know, you then have See, the terrain on the background of that, and, you know, like that's, real, real patterns would be. That's the reason that these, so simplifying it and taking all what you talk about. Yeah. So the question again is just, you know, what if you added complexity, basically, to it? Of course. <laughs> to, to paraphrase. Um, so I think why the geometric cases proved so useful in just figuring out what the methods tell you was because they were simple and they didn't. Oh, that's, how, that's, so, how you, that's how you approach yeah, it now from the yeah, yeah. So when you, there, in statistics, a lot of times you will do something more like that, but then you're doing more of an average over the whole thing and, um, you know, getting the, like, the distributional properties more and, so, because I, I have thought about doing that, but then none of these methods are really getting at, the, <laughs> at those Sorry, kind of things. So, no, 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 it's fine. Um, yeah, so these random rain cases, so now what we have are envelopes that are circular, <laughs> and they either overlap or they don't. But then within that envelope, you just have sort of random rain that, you know, so that some of those overlap and some don't, right? And they are one, are two. And, but what you find is you get sort of similar results and um, you can show different things about you know, how they pick up the distributional actually here. Um, the distribution in terms of how far apart on average are some of these. So, and I forget now which ones do that exactly. But, and again, the Jews is going to be higher because it's also accounting for the overlap 
and not just the average distances. Um, and then, of course, when you when they don't when the envelopes don't overlap, you get much higher values. And, um, yeah. So. Uh, and we had other cases too, where you know, so Marion Metermeyer works at the Met Office in the UK, where it's very cloudy, and so they found that instead of doing mode on the clouds, they wanted the holes <laughs> because it was easier to interpret. So we also have cases uh, where we just inverted some of our <laughs> cases to to be holes instead, and um, and then. What's really interesting is we would take these cases, some of the ones I showed you, but now we just added a point, like we, you know, the sensitivity thing, and um, and that really helps a lot. So we're hoping that people will use these for other methods, you know, and and um, that way it can be kind of one set of cases that people can really, you know, figure out and compare the different methods on the same set of cases again. Um, like those original geometric cases, you know, that they were very useful in that regard. Um, yeah, so in summary, you know, the distance-based measures generally give the same or similar information, but they all have their own unique properties that you need to be aware of, and so you might want to use more than one of them just to, you know, kind of pull out what might be happening. Um, none of them handle these uh, null cases at all, right? And, and not really, you know, and, if, and because even if you handle the null case, then you go to one or two points and suddenly they give you, you know, wildly different answers and, and that's not good. So basically you need to kind of decide for your own unique, you know, domain and, and uh, variables you're looking at, you know, how, how, many, how many points in each field do I need <laughs> before I start looking at these distance-based measures and um, and it's really on a something you have to just look at for your setting and um, yeah, and how to handle that you know in your in in your analysis. Um, both the centroid and Hausdorff distance give sort of average translation errors, but in a different way, right? So the centroid distance is the average translation error, which might be zero even though they're being translated <laughs> quite a bit, and we saw that. But the Hausdorff actually gives you, like, if you just took between every object, right, without even identifying objects, it, it essentially says, okay, what's the average translation error? Except not the average, but <laughs> what's the maximum? <laughs> but in some cases, it is, sort of, it is actually the average if you took each one. But it's technically the maximum. Of those. So, so, yes, the maximum. Um, but it's also highly sensitive if you have a point turn on, you know, so you have the same two fields over and over, and then you turn a point on, then Hausdorff is going to suddenly blow up. So I guess if you wanted to identify when you just get some arbitrary scatter, it would be useful, but I don't know why you'd want to do that. Um, and then these others, I think, are really what, you know, especially with mode, you know, when you're trying to merge and match objects and that kind of thing, um, I think I would want to use one of these measures in a, at least in addition to the centroid. <laughs> Maybe instead of, you know, because I, at least in my own, using my own version of mode, um, I've had a lot of trouble where I get like this giant object <laughs> matched with a couple of little objects, you know, and it just doesn't seem that satisfying. Like I almost want to do something different with that. And so I, so I think that these will, will show that, you know, to some extent. So, um, you know, because like I say, the MED in one direction, it might be really small in that case. But then when you do it from the large object, it's going to be really large. And so, so that can ha um, account for it. Um, but again, it, it doesn't inform so much about the frequency bias. So you need to have the frequency bias there. Or you can combine them in a way like with Zhu's metric. Um, measure. Um, so, so the two are kind of nice because it's like Zhu's, it's like the two things together and then if you look at frequency and MED then you can s separate them out and so it's um, different things you can do. And I, sorry we went <laughs> over a little bit but I guess, I guess we started at that time so it's sort of 
perfect if nobody has any questions. <laughs> but there were questions during it. So. <laughs> yeah. um, you mentioned that you have some remote. Oh, I, I didn't even realize I was there. Testing. <laughs> so. It works. It works. OK. Questions? Uh, yeah. so, <laughs> thanks. I, I enjoy this, and the, the having specific cases I think is a great way to illustrate some of this. I'm, I, you've mentioned a number of times the uh, the difference between a metric and a measure, mm -hmm. and I see the, the the nomenclature difference. Yeah. Um, what is the value in s being very careful? I mean, obviously, when you want to oh. talk to mathematicians, it's useful to be able to speak the same language. Um, yeah. But I just wonder if you can. Uh, sort of enunciate the value of a metric versus oh. any other measure any other for measure. Yeah. forecast evaluation. Right. Yeah, so I think that, um, like I say, I, I like the idea of not having symmetry. <laughs> and that's just so that you account for the false alarm versus, I think, you know, the field where, why they didn't like it, you know, in comparing these images is that, you, you have two images of the same thing, but maybe like a little different angle or something. I mean, y you don't want it to be different <laughs> depending on which picture you put in first because maybe you get a really good score, you know, but it's a totally different image, <laughs> right? So, so I can see the value in, in some fields, but I think in a verification setting where, you know, you really can have different things happen, it's important to know something about you know, is it the forecast that's doing something? Or is it, you know, the, I mean, it's probably the forecast, but, you know, is it that it's not getting enough of the observations or is it getting too much, you know? So, so, I, so I'm not in a, so there are good reasons, like, and especially the triangle inequality, I think you want that if you can get that, right? I think that's, you know, because if one thing is really closer to another, but again, it comes down to in what way, you know? And, and what are you measuring? Because if you're measuring the centroid, I mean, you, you could have any kind of thing, you know. So it's really on that, what that is, you know. So, yeah. Maybe just a, a quick follow-up. Which one is which, right? In, in terms of a weather forecast verification, where, you know, which one is which is, is kind of a sampling question, right? You have one forecast, but it could be a different one from a different ensemble member. And the, the, what has happened in reality might also be slightly different, right? Because if something else happened, the butterfly effect, right? Then you would think that it, it should go both ways. But if I'm looking at climate models and where the main question would be from my metric, what's the systematic bias of my model compared to observations? Then I do want to know which one is the model and which one is the observations, right? There, the ordering makes a, an enormous amount of sense. Where one, we have much more robustness, where in the other one, let's do different samples if variability is, is there or so. But the model bias is the core goal that we are interested in. Yeah. And that's different than what, you know, an individual forecast um, from a sample from a forecast could be compared yeah. to observations, I think. There, you might require more symmetry, whereas in the other one, you know that you want to measure the... the the systematic nature of, of these offsets. Yeah, yeah. I think it, you know it's it's good to know if it's symmetric or not, and it's good to know if which properties it has. And um, but yeah, it's not necessarily true that you need to worry about those properties, or maybe you want to exploit those properties, you know, or those lack of those properties, you know, like I did with the symmetry there. Yeah. So, and I think that's just you know in this setting that's important and. So I think it was easy to discard earlier, and people said, oh, well, it's not a very good measure, you know, so they discarded all those that weren't metrics. And um, for what they were doing, that's maybe a good thing, you know. Um, but for what we're doing, I think we can exploit some of that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Comments? When is all this going to be available in that? Soon, right? I mean, I, I think we're still just testing. So the code's written. It's just a question of making sure it's right, you know, <laughs> is where we're at. Yeah. Studies and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Do you have any recommendations on the study that you have done for 
two different ensembles? Would any of these metrics yield? Uh, can you, we have some remote participants, so you can that. <laughs> when you're comparing ensembles, do yeah. you think that any of these metrics would be um, better suitable for that? Oh. Like in telling me, so this ensemble really uh, encloses. <laughs> so I, I haven't thought a lot about ensembles. There have been some papers that have been um, using spatial methods for ensemble verification, and they've even come up with their own ways of doing that. Um, but I would think that, like with these distance measures, let's say, um, I would think they could be useful. Um, I'd have to think about how to do it, you know, how I'd want to do it. Yeah, but have but you tried? I haven't to tried. See if, uh, you really get the result you would expect. Oh uh, yeah, I haven't. I haven't looked at ensembles at all. So. <laughs> yeah, it's tricky. Yeah. I've taken a look at some of those papers, and it's a really yeah. complicated. Yeah, I've issue. looked at some. Of them. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I yeah. Yeah, I, I've managed to stay out of that so far. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> but, yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank Eric again. Thanks. And I'll thank all of you for coming. Thanks. Yeah.